You wanna have a little bit of fun today? Let's have some fun. I have a penchant for vintage Japanese and German instruments, like from sort of the golden age of electric guitars, like in the 60s and stuff. And I, I've got a few in my collection that I've gotten over the years that you know were in disrepair that I've been wanting to bring back to life. And we're gonna do that. Uh, and first, we're gonna start off with this one today, which is a Univox or a Greco, I'm not really sure, Japanese copy of a Hofner Beatle bass. And so obviously as a bass player and a Beatles fan, this is a really fun one for me. Um, now, when I got this instrument, the neck was so warped and so in such bad shape, I kind of thought to myself that it wasn't gonna be worth restoring. And I had some really kooky ideas of some stuff to do with it that was sure to anger a lot of purists. Um, but I thought before I would do all that stuff, I would try to bring it back to life. So let's uh, see if I'm successful. Other than missing the bridge, the instrument was pretty complete, save some pieces of trim and the nut, but you can see that the fingerboard was not only falling off, but it's also the whole neck was really twisted. So my thought was, if I can pull this old fingerboard off, maybe I can straighten the neck out enough to make this instrument playable again. So, of course, first thing I have to do is, you know, take it all apart. I stashed all the parts into a little parts container so I wouldn't lose any of them, even the screws, even though I won't use the screws probably, I'll probably use new ones. And then once I had it completely stripped down, um, I started just sort of cleaning it. Uh, I figured since I'm trying to just restore this instrument, I wouldn't strip off the cracked finish. All those cracks there are just finished cracks and, uh, and just sort of clean the instrument up the best I can without taking anything off of it. I also uh, started cleaning up the parts and checked the pickups to make sure they were still working, which they were. The heads were a little loose on a couple of the tuners, and um, I figured the best way to tighten them up was to just squeeze down that <laughs> that connection there, because that's really all it was. Uh, and it seemed to work. Um, I didn't want to start busting out welders and stuff. I was afraid I'd mess up the metal, because I don't really know what kind of metal it is. And now that I uh, had done that, I started thinking about the best way to pull the fingerboard off, and <laughs> Jimmy Duress had given me that giant razor blade once a couple years ago. It was the first time I've ever used it for anything practical, and it actually kind of kind of helped. But, um, you know, I just used some heat and some... Uh, some, uh, you know, for the five-in-one tool and stuff to just sort of get that fingerboard off. It came off almost complete, but there was some of the wood that stuck to the, the neck, which I had to take off with a hand plane and uh, some sandpaper. And while I had the fingerboard off, I decided to just sort of get that neck as flat as I kind of could. Of course, there's not a lot of wood to work with here because it's such a small, skinny neck, so um, I couldn't just totally strip it down. But here I have some sandpaper strapped to a flat surface, and uh, I just use that to sort of flatten out that playing side as much as I could. Then I hopped on the computer and uh, copied the measurements of the original fingerboard but actually added a little bit of width to it because the original one was bound and I decided early that I didn't want to try to bind this new fingerboard because I had so little to work with and I knew I was going to have to do some some fitting and stuff. I thought it would just be easiest and best to unbind it. And then I made a fingerboard. Since it's so skinny I was able to make it from a scrap of Wenge I had left over from making another fingerboard for a local bass maker, Adelina Bass. Uh, go check him out on Instagram. Um, so this is the side of one of his six-string basses uh, blanks, just so, and it would just barely fit. That's why I had to sort of take a little extra time to make sure I had it laid out properly on the CNC. And here you can see how, how close I was to fitting it uh, into the scrap of wood. But I love that I was able to use that otherwise, you know, mostly useless piece of wood. I was saving it for, like, little pieces of, of bridge parts or whatever in case I ever could have used it, but this is even better because I used it almost 99% of it. <laughs> and I did some wood inlays just, just for fun. I pre-fretted it and then uh, put it on the old neck. And uh, so this is kind of a, you know, a weird way to assemble a guitar because I don't normally do repair work. So it's a little bit different for me to sort of work from a finished piece. And I was pretty happy with the fit that I had on the neck uh, going right on there. Everything was lining up pretty good. And then I let it sit overnight and took it off. And I had just a little bit of shaping to do. But then I was thinking, wow, you know what? I was so accurate with this. I almost could have gotten away with, with doing a binding. I just had very little to scrape. And I think that the binding would have been okay. But uh, honestly, I think it looks fine. And I used a little violin varnish to touch up the parts of the original finish that I uh, took off. <laughs> it seemed appropriate. Then, of course, I had to, you know, do a fret job on it. Mm -hmm. 
I also used my Thunder Laser Fiber Laser to make these little badges to put on these types of guitars that I didn't build from scratch, rather just sort of rebuilt or restored. And now it was time to start putting it back together. I made a nut from a piece of scrap Corian. Okay, so this is the original electronics panel, which was not fully functioning properly. I wonder why. And so what I did is I'm just going to rebuild the whole thing. Uh, I've got new knobs and switches and caps and stuff. Uh, I'll put everything new, um, but I did cut the wires to get them out. So I'm also going to put little extensions on these uh, pickups so I can wire them all in when it's done. And um, it should be pretty easy. Or maybe what I'll do actually is I will... Uh, I'll I'll solder the extensions on here and then when I put it together I can connect them like that. First I tried copying the wiring the way I saw it, which didn't really make sense to me. Um, but then I realized that the little switches that I bought, I bought were three-way switches, not two-way switches. And so I was like, well, let's just see what happens. And I wired it all up and uh, guess what? It didn't really work. <laughs> so I'm going to rewire this the way that makes logical sense to me. And I think that what I'm going to do is, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I started to create my own wiring where I was going to have two tone drops and a three-way pick, pickup selector, then two volumes. But then I just went on the internet and I found the original Hoffner wiring schematics and I tried copying that. And uh, it seems to work, but it still doesn't make sense to me. My guess is that the Hoffner also used two-way switches, not three-way, and the, you know, the Japanese version copied it the same. And if I wired that all up, it would have made more sense. But uh, the way it's working is kind of fun. It's like a little mystery box. So I'm just leaving it, and you just kind of flip it around until you get a tone you like. And uh, then, of course, I went back to putting this all together. I had polished up those parts. I bought a new bridge for it, and I bought some uh, tape-wound Diodario strings that I had to actually widen up this uh, tailpiece a little bit for because they were a little bit wide. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a minute. I have to do a little bit of work on the neck pocket to get the neck to sit right with the bridge so the bridge wouldn't be too extended and yada yada. And uh, so of course that left the wood bare and I just used some tints to kind of make that sort of disappear into the finish. I think it did okay. I also had to add little risers to the bottom of the bridge that I bought. I just glued some uh, little scraps of ebony and, uh, and made that bridge a tiny bit taller and now it all sort of started going together. Except for those strings. Hey, check out this nonsense. <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, I wanted to put some tape wound strings on this base, of course, because that's the classic thing to do. And so I went online and I searched for some uh, tape wound short scale base strings and I found these, the Darios, uh, which seem perfect. If you look at the package, it even has a violin base right there on the cover. Um, so I was like, well, great. These are the strings that I need. So I bought them and I put them on, but they're just a little bit too short. I don't know if you can see that there, a little bit too short for this trapeze style tailpiece and the thread is on the other side of the zero fret which really annoyed me so i went on to instagram and i complained about it tagging the dare to be like hey what's up all these people commented saying oh yeah well you have to buy the mid-length scale strings for this bass which is dumb because it's a short scale bass the Dario never wrote back but labella strings caught on and they actually said hey we actually make strings specifically for the beetle bass why don't you try ours instead you can see it says right there on the bottom for the Hoffner Beetle Bass. So they graciously sent me this pack of strings and I'm gonna put them on right now. But what's cool is I already recorded a little bit of audio with the um, Diodario strings on here. So let's listen to what these strings sound like on this bass and then we'll listen to the Labellas. So the way it was wired didn't make any sense to me and I tried copying it and it didn't really work. And so then I went and I found the original Hoffner, the, the original uh, versions, wiring schematics. And so I did that and it's all working, but for the life of me, it doesn't make any sense, but it's kind of fun that way, right? So I don't really know what's happening. I know these are two volume knobs matching accordingly, but then there's like different passes where sometimes you'll, some combinations go to dead. So it seems to me that if you start with all of them at the bottom, you can kind of do stuff.
pretty. Look at that. <laughs> That's perfect because we don't want this tape to go around the post because it'll jeopardize the uh, tape wind. Take some of that off. Nice, let's keep going. Okay, this is with the labella strings. noise went away on that position. <laughs> I think the two sets of strings sound very similar, um, not huge difference in sound. As far as feel, the labellas are a little bit lighter and a little bit smaller, so there's less tension and they feel a little lighter and faster like that, a little smoother to the touch. Um, but more importantly, they actually fit the instrument, unlike the D'Addario, so uh, that's definitely what I'm, I'm banking on in the future, is I'll stick with those for these types of basses. Now, um, the bass plays great. It's a lot of fun. It's very unique and different. Um, the neck is not perfect now. There's still a little bit of a, a, a dip in the middle, like a little more than I'd like that I'm afraid to crank the truss rod any tighter. Um, but that's sort of, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> this is the knockoff. It's not the real Hoffner. Um, and I, it is totally playable and fun though, which is really cool. And, you know, I do firmly believe that like a lot of people put a lot of a lot of emphasis on gear and tech in, instead of just practicing. Like, I think he could go out and do any gig with, with any instrument and be fine. But an instrument like this is definitely going to inspire you to play different and think a little differently and sound differently for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's something that's you never played, I highly recommend trying it because it's a ton of fun. And if you have played, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This will be for sale eventually over at newperspectivesmusic.com as well as probably on my reverb page. But after doing such an overhaul on it, I want to let it sit for a few weeks and make sure nothing wonky or weird happens before I list it. So, uh, you know, that is that. Uh, and I'm a little sad that it worked, though, because the idea I had was a lot of fun. And uh, maybe I'll... Maybe I'll keep my eyes open for another one of these uh, that's even in worse condition to do that idea or just build it from scratch. I don't know. But uh, hey, thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoy this. A little bit different than what I usually do here. Um, but I actually have a couple more videos like this one coming up very soon with some other vintage kooky instruments that were from my, my back inventory that I finally brought out to uh, put back into service. So stick around and check out the next one. Be good.